I'm Jan Dinchenko, and today I will be joined by Chengkwach. Chengkwach, I'm Larry Chengkwach, and uh, to young people, you may just say Chengkwach. And one of the things that we will be talking, Chengkwach is one of the young people that uh, grew up most most of his time in Australia. So what he would understand far better is life in Australia. And one of the interesting topics that uh, I will is, is start talking to him about is the is a young man, of course, a Dinka man, and he's expected in the next uh, few years, if he was to get married, he has to pay a lot of dowries. He has to pay. In Australia, things are going up, uh, uh, not as uh, expected. And I will, we will be having a conversation, and this conversation will will be both ways. He may ask me questions and I will ask him questions. So, but he, if he can tell us about himself first, then I will appreciate that. Oh, okay. Uh, and it's all John Quat, John Gwanya Lair, and Monya Ruin. And I bought Australia uh, as a really young person. Um, so I grew up uh, going to primary school here, going to high school and, and to uni as well. Uh, so I've lived a uh, majority of most of my life here in Australia. Um, yeah, so I've observed and seen, you know, culturally, the cultural differences and things of that nature, which is what we're going to be discussing today. So, yeah. If we can start with the uh, with the issue itself, uh, and I will start that with you. Are you prepared to pay dowries or what? A story, do you know much about the, the dowry payment in the Dinka community? What are elders telling you and what are you getting? Uh, yeah, so what I've been told is that at the beginning or oh, back in South Sudan, so back in our culture, dowry used to be used in a, as an appreciation where if you meet someone you like, you then appreciate um that person by being raised by their family with values and things of that nature to come to your uh, clan. And so you pay the dowry to appreciate all that situation. Um, and then you go and begin your relationship. You have kids and you be your family. Um, yeah, so that's what I know so far of the dowry system. And what has changed in Australia to, to you? I uh, I think nowadays that we are in Australia. Australia is a capitalist country, which means we are individuals more than we are a collect uh, like a collective group type of thing. So mm. basically, how that works is everybody is an individual um, with their own respects and things of that nature. Um, so you have to work, um, go to uni, uh, build a career. So a lot of these stuff are done individually. So now that we are in a capitalist country, now bringing our culture in, it sort of sets a lot of young people back or it sets a lot of people that uh, have grown up in two different cultures. It will set them back because they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to begin since they are first generation. They wouldn't be able to start a process of building their careers, doing all these things, and then also going with the, with our culture stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so doing the dowry system, that would then set them back, um, which is, I, I, I think, one of the reasons why a lot of uh, young people nowadays would not be, you know, they're not really in support. Of, if they had their own way, they would rather not, follow the process but then because it's culture some of them would have to you know follow the process and things of that nature so do you think that uh, majority of them are conditioned because if one was to to marry within the within the culture and they have to have the the expectation that they have to pay this amount of uh, dowry and maybe they have an idea of buying their first car taking a loan from the bank or buying their first house or running a business, and then they realize later, okay, I don't have the money to be able to, to run this, uh, uh, this thing together. I have to let one go, and I have to... Is that what you think? Yeah, so I think uh, because with, with our culture, it's very 
ingrained in in us and our parents and you know the way we grew up it's it's told consistently okay this is what you have to do this is part of the culture so a lot of times you know a lot of young people in general would just go with the flow uh, mm-hmm. but if they had a choice to not some of them would not mind appreciating but not to the extent where you know it becomes you know you're marrying someone for eighty thousand dollars hundred thousand dollars and things of that nature mm. um most of them would rather not follow that process than do uh but since it's part of the culture some of them would just sort of go with the flow and just let things happen if if you were to have a, a way out and a way that uh, will pre- uh, or i can give you the cultural perspective on this mm. i think a lot of things are changing in uh, in the way we do thing as south sudanese back home yep. there was no a particular number of cows mm. that was supposed to be given uh, to the father of the daughter uh, in fact when the government came in when the the government started to to intervene uh, some time back the it was actually take example former board district which is all nyarwing board and uh, and twitch there was uh, there was a calf that was put that only 30 cows mm. unless out of your own pleasure you want to increase that but then it was not the maximum if somebody have 10 cows he cannot be prevented from marrying somebody daughter because he would come and say look this is what i have but god no god uh, will provide me with some cows one day one time so uh, mine is about relationship i want to establish my family and then at some cases there is an agreement between the the family of the the, the girl and the new the family of the man and that is changing when it come to to the western world there is almost a demand of what you must do and and if you look at the some young people as young as you guys may think that okay this was cultural no it's not cultural some things are new and and that's what i can say that uh unless the community look into this in a better way and say okay what are the benefits e- even though we continue to have it can we think about the future of these kids are they going to start renting a house are they going to buy a house are they going to have a car and how much and the girl is not uh, back then the girl was not participating in helping the boy which is now a different case so in terms of the cultural perspective uh, there are new inventions and i don't know where they're coming from so i i would rather tell young people don't take it from from us that the demand was part of the culture mm. yeah yeah and and then also when it come to now in some cases yes if you take a somebody daughter mm. and you don't pay anything they by that time no they will they will take their kids and they will start naming kids differently because yep. they're saying you you have not you have not paid our dowry so mm. that 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 was the the case but now if we come to you talk with a lot of young people what is the conversation what are they saying what do they need to be changed um the conversation mostly is cuz now they're in a different country um a different culture with different demands and they are the first generation um here in australia hmm. as we know with most, most other first generations for example the asians when they first came or the europeans or any other culture generally the first generation is the hard working generation so they will go to work they will work really hard to establish uh, themselves establish their families um, and most of them when they came here the europeans the asians and so forth they put their everything aside and sacrifice for their families and mm-hmm. work work really hard to establish themselves mm-hmm. and i think with us there's no any other different we are here the first generation here and most of um, young people or most generations that have come here are sort of going through that 
uh, transition as well, where they are the hardworking uh, generation that is being looked up to to establish that family base, uh, establish that grounded um, uh, work and start making things happen. Mm -hmm. But now when we go into our culture, this is where a lot of things kind of uh, inflict uh, because now our culture, we weren't from a business culture. So the culture we come from wasn't very business wise. So a lot of the things we follow are financially setbacks to a lot of the young generation. So an example of this could be, let's say someone young came to Australia, let's say he's 14 years old. Um, and he come and go to work and he's establishing himself. So he works, 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 go to uni. And now he wants to get married to someone. So now he's been asked to pay 60, for example, 70K. Mm -hmm. Now, if he does go ahead and do that, you can already tell this family has already been disadvantaged. So they have been disadvantaged financially. So they are going back and they are the first generation. So if his family starts, that means they will have financial problems and these financial problems will also go into their relationships, which will make the relationship complicated. So if there are kids now in this relationship, then it becomes complicated to build and establish that foundation that they need as first generations. So the conversation that I see through a lot of young people is that they are the first generation and they are trying to build themselves up. They are trying to build that foundation. But when our culture inflict with um, the establishment of their foundations, it becomes complicated because some of them would have to go with the flow, say, this is culture, this is what we have to do anyways, and they'll go ahead with it. And usually it may set them back, yeah. So the, I think this is, you know, some of the things that are sort of um, going into that space. Uh, from the experience, um, if I can help, I came to this country and I, I exactly did what young people do. And uh, this is one thing that I need to share with uh, our uh, listeners and viewers who may see this story. Uh, what Chiang Kwacha lamented on is true. And because when I came here, I have to work for some years and went back to school, took out a loan pay my dowries, and you taking it from the bank if you are a student. So, and looking at what you have to do there, you have to take a personal loan from the bank. And the personal loan will then may be either 40000 or 50000 And if you look at that, that is a seven-year uh, uh, seven uh, loan. And down the line, you may end up paying over 60000 based on the interest rate. And if that is for the young family, uh, you're looking at paying 700 to $800 back every month. And maybe the young family is starting, and yet uh, maybe the girl started maybe expecting and is not working. So the only, only the man will be working. And at that time, the financial difficulty start. And that's where the question of uh, what is the contribution? What is the contribution of, uh, of dowry and, uh, in domestic violence, in uh, family breakdowns? And this is where I will be actually talking to some very interesting uh, young ladies that have done research in this. And I hope I will find, uh, I mean, my, my end view, is one of the people who have just graduated and think she did that in, as one of my masters. And there's a uh, one young lady from actually from Nyarwin doing a, a PhD in the in the area and the impact of this. And these are the people that I will be able to engage and to understand the the implications. And this is where our community need to come in and say, okay, we are not saying the, 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 we are not saying stop it, but can we look into the negatives? that come with it. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly like what Ajak said. Um, our culture at the end of the day is our culture. And, you know, holding your identity, holding your culture together is very important for you to know yourself and for you to know where you come from. Um, so the <coughs> idea of it is definitely not to take it out. 
uh, but is to look at the economic side of things and to look at the the reality of the challenges, um, how they affect uh, people from building their foundations and for us as a community uh, to thrive and to be like any other community here in Australia. As we can see with the Indian community, um, the Asian community, at the end of the day, they look at their own culture and they see, okay, well, what is beneficial for us since we are now in a new country and facing new challenges new cultural things that are what can we implement and what can we take out of this that can help our community sort of move forward so yeah i think the idea is not to abolish it uh but yeah to look into it and see how can this support um especially these young generation from starting building their families as the saying goes families foundation are the backbone of any community out there so yeah, so I see it as a very important things to to look into, definitely. Also, in the community, there's a there's a debate, and the debate has always been about the young people going out of the. And this this is this can be con this can be said as a controversial uh, debate as well. Because the young people going out of their cultures to to date or to engage or to get married to cultures outside the Dinka or the the Sudanese cultures, and looking at uh, either somebody going to date uh, other Africans or somebody going to date maybe uh, other Australians, to me, which is understandable because of the environment and the the boy or the girl might have gone to school uh, with the same person that she's dating or she's going out with. But looking at the the price that come with it and the talking at the back uh, of the girl or the boy, uh, abandoning his own culture and not paying attention to culture. What, what, what is this debate? Is this debate going on also with the young people? And what are the causes? Why are people going out? And if there is some area that you can elaborate on that. Mm. I, I think coming into a new country, coming into a new culture comes with a lot of different things. As we know, <laughs> the young people nowadays are very open-minded and they don't look at things generally from a cultural perspective of this is what needs to be done or this is how you have to do things. Um, education really opens a lot of young people's minds and and that has pushed um, young people to, you know, look at other cultures and also see, you know, reconnect with uh, different kind of people um, where you find um, that love. If you don't find it in your community, someone else from a different community might be able to provide that for you. And I think this is what's sort of happening. So when you are in a new country, you're going to mingle with people within that country. And you're not really going to look at it from a perspective of um, I'm leaving my community of or things of that nature. But they just go with um, where they grew up. For example, there could be a Sassuranese growing in a non there's a there's not a lot of Sudanese in the area mm -hmm. and they might be able to meet different kind of people um Asians or uh white people Kawajan in general and that might be the group that they've grown up with uh childhood with and that might be the group that they connect with the most and so I think uh, young people nowadays are very open-minded and they just kind of going with the flow of the new country and the new culture that they're in so that's that's how I've I've been able to observe that situation so far. Okay, coming down now to, and um, this will be one of our our topic that we may discuss later in future. But and um, if we look at things now, Jankwachi, uh, you have uh, been a youth. You have talked to the young people. You have worked with them. You have lived in this country. And one of the major things that we we as parents and don't pay attention to is actually what is going on in the mind of uh, 
of a boy or a girl that is growing up in Australia, whether they came here older, born here. And I can say now majority of the children born here after two or two are 21. And so that we can say now there are above 20-year-old who are born in Australia. So it's not a new thing to, to our community. But these people, these kids are going through the same situation that those who were born overseas, because back then we, we used to say, oh, kids coming from Egypt and kids that came from other places where they have not gone to English schools, they have challenges in the school. But now we have a generation that are born here, but are going through this hardship. Mm. Is, there, is there any input that you can add on that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, what I can add um, is that a lot of our young people that are born here are really not connected to their culture. Um, there's really no connection. So a lot of them born here only know one culture, and that is the Australian culture. So a lot of them kind of grow up with a mix of identity. Uh, mm -hmm. They would go to school. Uh, they might uh, go start, let's say, prep. Um, you're with Kawajad throughout. Um, you go to grade one, you go to primary school, you go to high school, and you're with Kawajad your whole life. Um, and then someone comes and talks to you about um, your culture, which you have no idea of. You've never heard of things about your culture. You you really don't even know how or why your parents came to Australia and things of that nature. So a lot of them don't know these stories. And so they grow up with identity challenges and this is what then drives them to be going through a lot because you are different. Obviously, they can see you're from like South Sudanese and then in internally you, you feel like you don't know that side of things that much. So you're always fighting within um, to know your real identity, which I think it's one of the biggest things that a lot of the young people born in this born in Australia are kind of challenging with. Uh, that's what I can see, and that's the challenge at this point. So I guess in, in that area, uh, from what I can see that other communities do, um, they would, they, a lot of those other kids, for example, in the Indian community, they would be raised in a very community, strong foundation, community type of thing. Yeah. And so those kids will have that advantage to learn about themselves, learn about their culture, and then they'll go out there in the world knowing their culture, knowing sort of where they come from, their parents' story. Um, and because of that, they'll be very strong identity-wise. So they'll know themselves and they'll be able to function um, having those values that are taught within um, their communities and from their homes. And so with our children is a bit different because they are being influenced every single corner. So whether it's watching uh, uh, black Americans on, 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 TV. Know, on TV, getting influenced by that, whether it's going to school and everybody you see every day from prep all the way to university is a Kawaja and you don't know your real, like real culture um, and the values that from your culture haven't really been taught to you because the foundation you kind of grow up in wasn't as strong. Um, these are the, the these are then the challenges that then go into place. And so um, they will grow up kind of lost in a way, but also trying to trying to find themselves. And these this is what I see, especially a lot of the young people born here. For those that kind of lived in Africa for a little bit, at least you have that little bit of uh, knowledge about where you come from, your culture, uh, the meanings of things, uh, the values of your culture. And so when you come here, you're not really fighting that much um, your identity because you already know a little bit about yourself. And then you sort of go in the world uh, more freely and you able to function properly. Uh, where with, with uh, the young people here is a little bit challenging because they're also going through identity crisis at school, uh -huh. um, might be racism, and they're not as resilient as I would say the young people that sort of lived in Africa for a little bit because those ones were faced probably some challenges that made them strong internally. 
while the ones here might not have that internal strengths. So little things like, you know, name calling um, might affect them heavily. Um, yeah, so those are the things that I, I sort of see at the moment. And, and because of, uh, like, some of the things that you have just mentioned now, to us, name calling was not uh, something that, yeah, it will bother you, but you will have to leave to get over it. That was the that 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 is from our own, our own perspective as uh, as parents because we when we were growing up in the cattle camp, for example, it was normal. People will maybe you got a disability. I'll give you an example. I got a lazy eye, and they will use to compose a song about it, and they they <laughs> they will be dancing. And to, to, to that uh, song. So the only thing that I have to, to do is actually to learn to, to sing also and create the songs and develop resilience out of, uh, out of the, the area where I was expected to be weaker. And how do we convince our kids that, look, yes, you can go through this, but uh, there is a way that you can live with it. And if that is the situation, or I will give an example. When we were uh, refugees in, in the East African countries, we went through a lot, more than here, more than some of, because it was obvious that the po police will arrest you in Kenya or in Uganda, and they will demand money, and they will beat you up, but you have no court to go to. It was by default, you have no rights. So, and... That's what we live through it. But how do we communicate that to our young people? Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, like um, I wouldn't have all the answers. I'm not a parent myself. I don't have kids. Um, but from my own observation, uh, I guess strong foundation is always a great start to things like that. Um, so by us building strong foundations at home, uh, being able to exercise values that we want our kids to adapt to. Sorry. Um, yeah, so for us to start those foundations um, at home uh, and being able to provide our children with those values that we want them to adapt to uh, is usually the best um, start for any child. Um, so parents or young people in relationships having those deep conversations about how they want to raise their kids, um, what sort of values they want to put into those children, um, how they want to go about it, how they want to start about it is usually the, the best way to go about it. Um, in regards of kids that have already in the world, um, I guess you can start from where you are, uh, begin with what sort of values, again, you want to Im implement into your children and slowly exercise those um, uh, values and resilience uh, within your household. Um, I guess that's probably the best way to go about it. If we are now coming back to, to our topic, and, and that would be from you now as an individual, uh, if you look at the camera and tell our elders, it's starting from me. Why, why, what do we need to do to, in order to, to change the debate on dowry and to ensure that uh, young people are encouraged to marry within the cultures and also to what will be the reasonable, uh, the reasonable dowry that would encourage young people uh, to marry? And also, what do we need as parents and as, as elders within the community to do in order to understand that youth are under pressure? Mm. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest um, things right now is the gap between the elders and, and young people. There's a huge gap. Um, a huge gap of misunderstanding, I would say. Um, so I think a dialogue is is usually the best way to solve problems. Um, so having a dialogue between elders and young people, uh, like a conference type of thing, 
and really hear the youth voice and hear what they think about things and how they you know how they operate what they see about this culture what they see about their own culture and really um put down all the you know ideas that have been shared and and put everything into perspective how would this support our our community what are the challenges with with our youth at the moment and how can we close that gap between that understanding between the elders and the youth um how can that gap be brought closer uh, by having those dialogues by the elders listening to the youth and also the youth really understanding what the elders think of things as well because the elders might be thinking about different things and then the youth think about different things and no one is coming to the table to sort of sit down and for them to hear themselves out and to see what is the best way to sort of move forward uh because at the end of the day that's what they both need the elders their own expectations are for the best of their children and the children their own expectations also are the best for their sort of future as well so if they have those kind of conversations and and really understand each other from you know having those conversations i i reckon that would be able to bring about uh ideas of looking at this dairy system and how the the challenges of it and the the pros and cons i would say and and really look at what needs to be sort of changed and what can be kept and moving forward uh i i reckon that would be um that would be great in in that sort of way mm. oh thank you and uh i thank you for the time and also we will be talking a lot of things uh, about a lot of things in days to come and also you are my first guest <laughs> of uh, of this podcast and that will be broadcast on youtube and most of the time i'll be also seeing other uh, ways so if you can invite some of your age group and age mat and young people i'm able to listen to them i will be able to to have this platform ready and whatever whether they want it on video or they want it as a voice I think I I need to open that uh, conversation up mm. and for us to be able to sit down and say look we need to change something yeah. and because uh, one of the topic that I may uh, talk to you about later is the issue of uh, uh mental health and the issue of youth suicide and the issue of uh, uh work as well and you being a graduate and having uh work also uh, what is the best way to motivate uh, the other young people to be able not to just look into take example our cultural events uh, we don't just take uh, dancing as a, as a career yep. we take it as a hobby like mm-hmm. i do it as a hobby but i i have to do my things yeah and i think i will appreciate uh, you talking to your friends and telling some other talent who have the talent to tell stories to come to me and mm. we can we can do that nice definitely yeah. yeah um all right uh thank you jack for this interview uh for those uh that are not aware of the youtube channel uh go and follow it on youtube jang uh, deng chenko and also if you have ideas that you want to bring on to um the podcast uh yeah do put your interests in there and yeah come have a chat uh it's, it's more of a dialogue learning more about uh, our culture learning more about our community um and putting our voices out there so yeah thank you thank you so mm, that was pretty good yeah yeah <laughs>